Galatians chapter 6, uh, getting very, very, very close to the end of this chapter. Uh, end of this book, I should say. But in Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, Paul begins a conclusion. He winds down this letter by reviewing the major points that he brought up in the letter. Uh, remember, if you, if you hold your Bibles and you, you pit between your thumb and your forefinger the book of Galatians, I mean, it, it's a postcard. It's, it's 10 or 12 pages. It's taken us a long time to go through it because it's rich with Bible truths and theological doctrines, etc. But uh, for the Galatians, when they received this letter, uh, they would have sat down and read it in, I don't know, 30 minutes? So Paul, in the end chapter of the letter, has gone back to say what he said. Remember, you know, when they give a speech, if you've ever taken a speech class, they say, tell them what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. We're in the tell them what you told them part of the speech of the letter where Paul uses in his own hand now, we'll talk about why Paul would uh, take the pen from somebody else's hand and finish the letter in his own hand because that's what he says he does. And Paul will go over the most important points of the book of Galatians in these last few verses. What we read in verse 11 is uh, Paul saying to the Galatians, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. And the reason Paul says that is because he didn't write this entire letter with his own hand. We know that Paul had what's called an amanuensis, and I'll show you that word in just a minute. He had a copyist. He had a secretary. He had a, a scribe, and that scribe's name was Tertius. Uh, I don't make any of this thing, these things up. I get them from the Bible. When Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, this is what it says in Romans chapter 16, verse 22. I, Tertius who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Paul had a scribe with him. He had someone that he dictated his letters to, and that scribe wrote the words. That scribe's name was Tertius. This is the man who wrote the bulk of Paul's letters. So in verse 11, when he says, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand, at the end of this letter, Paul has taken the quill from Tertius and is finishing this letter in his own handwriting. So I told you I'd show you the word. Here it is. Tertius was Paul's emanuensis. Fancy word for what we would call a secretary. He was his scribe. He was the one that wrote Paul's letter for him. Paul dictated them to Tertius. I'll show you a couple more verses to prove that this was common in Paul's writing. Look what it says in Colossians verse 4 or chapter 4 verse 18. At the end of the letter, Paul takes the quill or whatever he wrote with from Tertius and this is what Paul says. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If he would have written the entire letter, he would have never had to say, I'm writing this part of the letter myself. But he does say that. I'm writing this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. Now, just as an aside, so you can scribble down in case you don't know, there are four letters in the New Testament that Paul wrote while he was imprisoned, while he was in a prison cell. Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians. Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and his short letter to his friend named Philemon. All of those Paul wrote from a prison cell. Just an aside, they're called the prison epistles. We're about to go into the book of Colossians and do a verse-by-verse -verse walk through the book of Colossians. Uh, and that is one of Paul's prison epistles. Galatians is not. He was a free man when he wrote Galatians. He's an imprisoned man when he writes this, uh, the book of Colossians. In 2 Thessalonians, he says the same thing at the end of this letter. In chapter 3, verse 17, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Exact same Greek words. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And this is a distinguishing mark, a very interesting statement that Paul makes here. This thought or this fact that Paul writes the end of his letters with his own hand with his own hand, is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. 
So Paul tells us, Tertius writes the bulk of the letter. At the end of the letter, I pick up the pen and write the final greeting. One more verse in Galatians chapter 4, verse 13. I want to ask the question, because we should, because it's in front of us. Look at what Paul says in verse 11 of Galatians 6. See with what large letters I am writing. So the question is, why were Paul's letters so big? I mean, how many of you right now have a large letter Bible? Large print Bible. Anybody? It's okay. There's two. There's three. Large print Bible. Why do you have a large print Bible? Because you can't see. So at least one of the thoughts, and I'll show you a verse that makes uh, theologians think this. It may be right, it may be wrong. I'm just offering it because Paul says, in all scriptures God breathed and profitable, Paul says, I'm writing this in large letters. I think it goes well beyond capital letters. All of the script was written in all capital letters. But he says large letters, and here's the verse that I want to show you. It could be that th Paul's thorn in the flesh that he speaks of, God gave me a thorn in the flesh to keep me humble. Three times I pled with God to take the thorn in the flesh, but nevertheless, His grace is sufficient, Paul says. But he, he had this thorn in the flesh, this physical ailment that God gave him to keep him humble. And it may have been his eyes, may have been his eyesight. Look what he says in this very book. We covered this when we were there in Galatians 4, verse 13 and 15. Listen to what Paul says about his physical condition. But you know that it was because of a bodily injury, a bodily illness. It was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe. So something about Paul's appearance was ugly. Something about Paul's appearance was something that people could despise and loathe and say, oh no, that you must be cursed of God to have that ailment. But they didn't. You received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus Himself. Even though my appearance didn't, didn't uh, justify that, you knew who I was, a messenger of Jesus Christ, and you received me as that. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? You received me as a messenger of God. That's what an angel is, a messenger. You received me as one who's, who had come to give you the gospel of Jesus Christ to save your souls, to guide you in your Christian lives. But now you're turning away to the Judaizers. He says, where then is that sense of blessing that you used to have for me? And then he says in the very last line, and this is what I want you to see, for I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So it seems, if we're literal interpretation, uh, interpretationists, and we are, it seems that Paul had a bodily illness that affected his eyes and that the Galatians didn't despise or loathe him for that. They received him as a messenger of God, no matter what his physical appearance was. And Paul says, the love, the heart that you had for me when I first arrived was that because of my illness, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. That's how much you loved me. That's how much you accepted me as a messenger sent by God. So maybe, maybe it was because Paul's eyesight was bad. And that's why Paul wrote this, the, this, this final greeting with large letters. Uh, whatever the reason Paul wrote in these large letters, he takes the quill and he finishes the letter himself to emphasize at least two reasons. I'm a historian, you know that. And uh, at least two reasons why Paul would, would say these things to us, that he is writing this letter in his own hand. One of those is the idea of he wants to emphasize what he's going to write next. I'm going to summarize this letter and I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to tell you why I wrote to you in the first place. Uh, in this summary, it's so important to me that you understand it, that I'm going to do it myself. But there's also, to me, a, a historical value to this. Uh, turn with me, because I don't have it on the board, but turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
You got to go forward in the book a few chapters. Look at what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Why would Paul say, remember what he just said here, this is a distinguishing mark in every letter, this is the way I write. Why would God the Holy Spirit have Paul tell us about the way he scripted his letters? Why is that important? Look at what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. He says, I don't want you to be shaken. Shaken by whom? He says, I don't want you to be shaken to, to be, uh, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by a spirit or by word or by a letter, as if it was from us, as though the day of Christ had come as if it were from us, a letter as if it were from us. What I'm trying to tell you is Satan had his frauds on the ground that were writing letters in Paul's name and sending them out to churches. And the, the, the untruths, the false doctrines in those letters were stirring churches up. So Paul says, when I write a letter, this is the way I write it. Tertius starts it, and at the very end of the letter, I pick up the pen. We have experts today, uh, handwriting experts. And you might have something that's supposed to be ancient, and it's signed. Say uh, we just watched the World Series last night. Say you had a baseball signed by Babe Ruth. A, 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 a hundred-year-old base, 50, however old Babe Ruth is. Uh, this baseball that was signed by Babe Ruth. How would you determine that? You would, have a, you would have a handwriting expert who has verified copies of Babe Ruth's autograph on file. You'd have an expert compare the two and see whether it was fraudulent or not. Paul is doing exactly that. He is saying, if you want to distinguish my letters from fraudulent letters, look for my pen at the end of the letters because my pen is, in, is, is distinguishable from all others. I write in a certain way with large letters. If it's from me, this is the way it'll look. And I'm saying all that because if you went into the book of Galatians, and I, I doubt any of you have ever had this thought, but some people think part of the Bible is written by God, but there are other parts that aren't God written. And Paul is making absolutely certain that we know that his letters are all written in a certain way and that the book of Galatians is God-breathed truth. God wrote the letter. God, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, wrote this letter. And we can verify that because of Paul's large handwriting at the end of it. So from a historical standpoint, it's significant. One more thought I have uh, just in passing. What if an archaeologist today... Now, let me make this statement. We do not have any fragments. I mean, a fragment being this. This is the paper that I'm working off of, we don't have anything even this big that is the original Pauline letter. They're all gone. The letter that Paul wrote the Galatians is gone. By God's own design, it is not on earth. We don't know where it is. It's never been uncovered. It's probably destroyed, gone. We don't have the Galatians letter that Paul actually wrote to the Galatians. But let me ask you this. What if we found it one day? What if archaeologists found the letter? How would we verify that it was actually the letter that Paul wrote? How would we verify that it was actually the God-breathed, inspired letter that God the Holy Spirit was writing through Paul while Paul was choosing the words also? How would we verify it? We'd get to Galatians chapter 6 in verse 11, and we'd see if the handwriting had changed. And if the handwriting had changed and it were large letters, it would give us an indication, this is the one. Because in all the autographs that we have, in all the copies that we have, all capital letters, no periods, no commas, no exclamation points, no quotation marks, there's no grammar in the book. The oldest copies of Bible writings that we have 
are all capital letters, all the same size. They're not the book, they're not the letters that Paul wrote. They're accurate, but they're not the letters that Paul wrote. So from a historical standpoint, it's important because if an archaeologist ever does say, we found one of Paul's writings, Satan will try to destroy it instantly. But we have some, some archaeological historical fact that we can use to look at that letter and determine whether it might or might not be Paul's original letter. And who knows? Is God capable of saving a piece of writing for 2,000 years? I give you the Dead Sea Scrolls. Easily capable of keeping writing uh, alive for 2,000 years. Will God ever show the world an original, an original letter? Uh, I don't know. He doesn't tell us that He will, but He doesn't tell us that He won't. And if He ever chooses to, we have some proofs that we can look at the letter and see what's going on in it, see whether it's really Paul. So Paul finishes the letter himself. That's all I'll say about that. He finishes the letter in his own handwriting to emphasize his final thoughts about the big issues he raised in this letter. The biggest issue that Paul raised in this letter is that salvation, if you are born into Adam's race, you are unsaved, separated from God, from birth. You're unsaved. And Paul's biggest push in this letter was to say that in order for an unbeliever to become a believer, the only way that's possible is by faith. That justification, when God the Father says, you are righteous, at the moment He declares us righteous, that's the moment that we have believed in His Son, we are justified, and that was simply by faith, not by any works which we have done. But according to His righteousness, He saved us. And that's Paul's push. And the reason that's his push is not to teach the gospel because these people already knew the gospel. He was writing to Christians that had believed that gospel. The problem was you had these Judaizers. These are Jewish people, men. They would have been men. These are Jewish men that were going into the early church in Galatia, these four churches at least in the region of Galatia, and they were saying salvation of an unbeliever is not by faith only in Jesus Christ only. Salvation of an unbeliever, to get an unbeliever to get to heaven, to become not death but life, to become not darkness, but to be changed eternally into light. Faith in Jesus Christ plus keeping the Mosaic law, circumcision. Faith plus works. And Paul wrote this letter to say, that's not what I taught. That's not what I received from Jesus Christ. That's not what I taught you. When I first came, you, you accepted me as an angel of God. You would have even plucked out your own eyes to give them to me. You were that interested in the messenger of God that he had sent. What happened to that? Why are you now believing what the Judaizers are telling you in the perversion of the simple gospel, believe and be saved? That's Paul's main message, and that's what we're about to see. He's talking about his adversaries, his enemies of the gospel, these Judaizers that had come into the church and were destroying the churches in Galatia. That's why he wrote this letter, to save the churches of Galatia from walking away from the gospel. Look what he says in verse 11. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised. That it's not faith only. If you're not keeping the Mosaic law also, you can't be saved. I'll show you a verse in just a minute that proves the strength of that statement. If you aren't following the Mosaic law by being circumcised, then you aren't saved. Is that a true statement or a false statement? I'd hate to be a woman if that's a true statement. Right? I mean, just the most obvious statement of all. If you have to be circumcised to be saved, I'd hate to be a woman. I mean, it's just, it, even, even human logic breaks this down and destroys it. But those who desire, these Judaizers who are coming into your church, who desire to make a good showing in the flesh, they are trying to compel you to be circumcised. And there's a reason for that, simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. 
We'll talk about that more in a second. Look at verse 13. For those who are circumcised, the Jewish Judaizers who have come into the church, Paul's enemies, his adversaries here, those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves. They want you to keep the law, but they don't even keep the law. But they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. There's a game going on here. Missionaries play this game a lot. Let's get the numbers up. Let's get the numbers up. We have to have numbers. We have to show that we're, we have so many more converts to our gospel than Paul has to his gospel. There's a game being played here. And Paul uses a, a play on words and in the flesh here. But look at the first thing. He says, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh. They want to be recognized. They want to be seen as soul winners. These Judaizers, they're looking at external things. And that's this play on word, this clipping of the foreskin, clipping of the flesh. There's your play on words. They want to be known as soul winners. They want to be recognized for their achievements in getting high numbers of people to adopt their view of salvation, which is a view that will send you straight to hell. But it's a numbers game. They want to be recognized. They want to be applauded. They want to have a good, he says, they desire to make a good showing in the flesh. So they want to be recognized for what they're doing. They want people to see it. Whoever sent them from Jerusalem, they want to be able to come, go back and say, we have cleaned up that perversion that Paul, uh, that Paul taught, and we have rightly told the people in the churches that you have to believe in Christ and do the works of the Mosaic Law. Wrong. That's wrong. The play on words, circumcision, he says, in the flesh. In the flesh, they try to get you to be circumcised, but they're, they're having to, trying to make a good showing in the flesh. So obviously circumcision involves removal of male flesh. And so Paul, the contrast here, I tell you that the more you read the Bible, the more you see these stark contrasts. It's like, like darkness and light, uh, life and death. Stark contrast. Look at the stark contrast here. Paul is saying, I'm not like these men. All these men want is to, be, to, to, have, to have a good showing. They want to be seen and recognized. They want the number count to be up. They want the external. They want to be able to prove because of your clipping of the flesh that somehow you've gone over to their, their world. But here's the contrast. Paul, Paul himself was interested in an internal, not an external thing, Paul was interested in an internal, God the Holy Spirit-led change in the Christian converts in Galatia. He was trying to win souls to take people from death to life and guide them in the Christian life. That's what he was all about. The Judaizers were not. They were more interested in the external mark. They were more interested in the mark that would mark their converts to their particular uh, way of salvation that was wrong. Believe and work is wrong. But that, that's what we're up against here. That's what Paul was up against. And that's why he takes the pen to say, you have to understand the motives of these people, you Galatians. They're not out for your soul. They don't want, to, they don't want you to uh, continue in your life in your Christian life, in your walk with the Lord. They are a destructive force. They're sent from Satan, not by uh, the hand of God. So that's what he's saying here to them. They want numbers. They want to be recognized. When we get down two verses later, Paul would say, I would never boast about things like this. I boast about Jesus Christ and Him only. I don't boast about how many numbers. We, we never read in Paul, in the last letters of Paul, the last thing he wrote was to Timothy. We don't read in the letter to Timothy, oh, I'm so thankful that God allowed me to, to start the church in Thessalonica, in Berea, in Galatia, in, in Philippi. I was, I was such a faithful servant to do this and to do that. He doesn't read a resume of everything he wants to be recognized for because he says, for me to live is Christ. When I wake up in the morning, I try to follow Jesus Christ, and that's all that's important to Paul. 
The Judaizers, he says, are a totally different type of people. They're interested in the externals, which are of no value. I'm interested in internals. I'm interested in transforming your lives to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. I'm not interested in this external circumcision. It's of no value. So Paul's focus, quickly, here we go. Paul's focus, just to put it on paper, Paul wanted unbelievers saved. That's why Paul, that's why Paul allowed himself to be scourged, whipped. That's why Paul never gave up. That's why Paul held firm to the faith through everything he went through, shipwreck, hunger, thirst, all those things we read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Why? Because Paul's heart was that he wanted unbelievers saved. And what was his message of salvation? Through belief in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection in their place. Simple as that. You're the one that deserved to die, but Christ took the payment in your place. And that's what Paul wanted for people. What else did he want now that they were believers? So that in believing they would become new creations of God. At the moment you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you were baptized by God the Holy Spirit, uh, the, Holy, the, the human spirit uh, came alive in you, you became a living being, if you will, a new creation. That was Paul's desire. Paul wanted Christians, he wanted unbelievers to become Christians and he wanted them to grow and be transformed to be ambassadors of God. He wanted them to live according to the indwelling power of God, the Holy Spirit. That's what he says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Walk according to the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is Paul's heart. So in the very end of his letter, he's saying the message of salvation that these other people have brought into the church is straight from the pits of hell. It's wrong. And I'm trying to get you to remember what the truth is. Faith in Jesus plus circumcision is a work of the, as a work of the Mosaic law is faith plus works, and that's wrong. He says in verse 11, they try to compel you to be circumcised. This is what the word compel means. It may not read strongly enough in the English. It's the word anankazo in the Greek, and this is what it means to force somebody to do something. These people that are coming into the Galatian churches aren't saying, oh, let, let us offer you another uh, substitute gospel. They've come in with force, with the force of Jerusalem, and they have come in there to force people to believe something different. You are wrong. Paul is a fraud. And we are right. We were sent by God. We have the true gospel. And the true gospel is that you have to believe and be circumcised. And Paul has written this letter to say that is heresy. That's not what I taught and that's not right. Believe and be saved. Believe only, faith only. They're trying to force people to get circumcised because only being circumcised can you be saved. Now, here's the verse I told you I was going to show you. Look what it says in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, about these Judaizers. <laughs> Look what it says in Acts chapter 15. Some men came down from Judea. What would you call them? Judaizers. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren. So they were teaching Christians. They were subverting the truth. They were perverting the truth. And this is what these men from Judea and Jerusalem were teaching in the churches. They were teaching Christians that what Paul taught you is wrong. This is right. This is what they said. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Is that a true statement or not? Is it a true statement or not? It's not a true statement. The Philippian jailer asked Paul, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What did he say? Believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. The other side of the coin was, believe in the Lord Jesus and be circumcised. Because if you're not circumcised according to the Mosaic law, the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And this is what Paul is fighting in Galatia. 
This is why he wrote the letter, because this has gone out to the churches. <clears throat> he ends this by saying they're doing this, trying to gather numbers and asking you or trying to force you to be circumcised for a reason, so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Now let me remind you of what these people were saying. Paul was preaching faith only in Jesus Christ only. That's accurate. Only faith. Don't, don't mix it with any work, whether it's baptism, giving to the church, uh, quitting whatever your bad habit is. Don't mix it with anything. The Bible says faith only, faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. So don't add yourself to salvation, that'll ruin it too. It's Jesus doing all the work and you believing it. That's what salvation is. That's Paul's message. So Paul's preaching faith alone and Christ alone, and he was persecuted harshly by the Jews. So the Judaizers are thinking, if we hold on to the Mosaic law, if we compel people to be circumcised, we won't be as persecuted as Paul is, who has abandoned the law of Moses and taken up this position of faith only in Jesus Christ only, no works of the Mosaic law. And so that was their idea. We'll be persecuted less by the Jews because remember, the Judaizers were teaching that Jesus Christ was the way to heaven. They were teaching that. That Jesus Christ is the Jewish Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ is the one that was crucified, buried, and resurrected for your sins and mine. They were preaching that. But they were adding to it in order to be saved. You have to believe that and also be circumcised. And Paul says, no. But the idea that these guys were still holding on to the Mosaic law would tend to appease the unbelieving Jews. It's horrible that you've adopted Jesus as the Jewish Messiah because we reject that, but at least you're better than Paul because Paul has turned away from keeping the law and is this New Testament Christian all of a sudden. So it would appease the unbelieving Jews that at least they were less offensive. The Judaizers were less offensive to them. And that's what it says. So that, what does it say? Simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ the way Paul was. So the Judaizers were still keeping the law after all. They just added faith to the law. And don't, don't mix up the order there. They weren't adding the Mosaic law to Jesus Christ. The law was primary in the Judaizers' lives. The law came first. They were keepers of the law. And then, oh, Jesus, okay, we'll add him in. We'll scoop him in to our belief system, and that is wrong. So the Judaizers wanted more converts to their gospel. They wanted more converts to their gospel and Paul says, these people that are forcing you, trying to force you to become circumcised, they're not even keeping the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast. So that they may boast, so that they may brag about the numbers of converts that they have to their system of salvation. And make no mistake, every church out there has a system of salvation. You get to choose your denomination. Every church out there, ours included, has a system of salvation. Ours happens to be based on biblical truth. Believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. Uh, you have churches like the Church of Christ that believe in order to be saved, you must be baptized. They would take circumcised out of this and say, unless you are baptized according to the custom of Paul, you cannot be saved. That's the church of Christ. You have to add baptism to faith in order to be saved. There are other churches, the Methodist church, who would believe at least certain sects of the Methodist church exactly what we believe about salvation. 
But to the end of that, they add, but you can lose your salvation. Is that a true statement? No. I mean, there's a reason why we're a Bible church. I'm not trying to hold us up as something that we're not, but we hold to the teachings of the Scripture very, very tightly. We're not a Lordship Salvation Church. We're not a Calvinist church. And it's been like that for 45 years. God gives man free will and says, Choose this day whom you will serve. Believe in the Lord Jesus or don't. It's your choice. Thank God I know what you have all chosen. But the Judaizers came in and said, That's not true. That's not true. What you have to do is believe and do a work of the Mosaic Law. And it doesn't matter what the work is. It doesn't matter whether it's eating certain kosher foods and not eating unclean foods. We saw that in the book of Galatia. Peter had a problem with that. It doesn't matter whether it's adding circumcision. It doesn't matter whether, it doesn't matter whether it's turning away from any bad habits you have. It doesn't matter what you add to the work of Jesus. If you add anything, you've perverted the purity of the cross. God the Father sent Jesus, the Lamb of God, to die in our place. And that's the only thing that's ever been done on this planet that God the Father was satisfied with that would pay the price for your sins and mine. There's never been anything that you've ever done and there's never been anything that I've ever done that God the Father was satisfied with enough to say, that's why I'm bringing you to heaven. He looks right past me to the cross of Jesus Christ, to the imputed righteousness that, that He's given me through belief in Jesus Christ. I'll be in heaven and you will be in heaven, not because of how wonderful we are, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. If you've never really thought about these things in any depth, I want you to do these three things. I want you to recognize your own guilt of sin. See, a lot of people believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world, but it's only years later, and I've heard testimony from people, it's only years later that they realize that I'm the sinner. It's not you're the sinner. It's I'm the sinner. I'm the sinner that was born into this slave market of sin, the Bible calls it. I'm the one that should be dunked into the lake of fire forever because I, as Adam's child, am the one who was born under the penalty of death. It's me that has a problem. And so what I'm asking you to do is recognize your own guilt of sin before the, man, the, the God who created you. You are guilty of sin. You stand condemned if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And because of that, you are absolutely helpless. You're helpless to change your condition. There's one thing you can do that will satisfy the wrath of God against the sin of Adam. What is that one thing? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are two things, because God always has choice in this world. There's not one thing, there are two things. What's the other way that an unbeliever can satisfy the wrath of God because of his sin penalty he inherited from Adam? What's the other way that man can satisfy the wrath of God? There is a way. Say that again you can be dropped into the lake of fire for all eternity and pay your own penalty. When does that end? Never. Men have a choice. Each of us have a choice. If you've never made this choice, I'm trying to lay it before you the way Moses and Joshua did thousands of years ago. You can choose life today. You can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you can leave this world a Christian or you can choose to reject Jesus Christ, His offer of salvation, the Father's offer of the Lamb in your place. And you can say, no, I'll do this on my own. And you will do it on your own. And it'll take you an eternity in the lake of fire to do it. That's the choice. There's no compelling. God is not one that compels. 
God, Paul is not one that came and forced anything on the Galatians. Paul came in the spirit of the love of Jesus Christ and says, there is a God and his name is Jesus and he loves you very much. And I'm here to introduce you to him, Galatians. That's why he came. That's why he went there. That's why he risked his life to go through Asia Minor and to found these churches. Because he loved men the way God loved men and wanted all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We do have choice. So I want you to recognize your own guilt of sin and your helplessness before the Father. You can't fix this on your own. I also want you to trust that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He paid the price for your sins. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, He paid the price for your sins. What was the price of sin? What did God, God say in the, in the garden to Adam? On the day you eat of the fruit of that tree, you will have to live 30 years and do good deeds before I'll let you into heaven. You hear how, how uh, yeah, I'll use the word obnoxious that would be to the justice of God. The 30 years of human good works could lift the penalty of Adam eating that fruit. He didn't say, Adam, on the day you eat of the fruit of that tree, unless you join a church, unless you give 10% of your money, unless you're circumcised, just horrid to think that anything a sinning man could do could please God on its own. It's a ridiculous concept. So God in the garden promised the deliverer. The seed of the woman will crush your head one day, Satan. And we know from Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, that the seed of the woman was Jesus Christ. So I want you to trust that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, because He did, historically, it's a fact. When He died on the cross, He paid the price for your sins. And that was His death on the cross. The three hours of spiritual death He endured on the cross while he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Elo, Elo, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's the answer? Because of Frankie. Because of Vera, because of Johnny. That's why he did it. Why did he forsake Jesus Christ on the cross? Because Jesus had sins that he had to pay for. Jesus had sheep that he wanted to be in the eternal presence of his Father with forever. And that's us. Why did the Father forsake the Son? Add your name there. Because of me. That's why He did it. And lastly, through faith in Jesus Christ, I want you to know that if today you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you can walk free. Free. Finally free. And you can have eternal life with Jesus Christ with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, with everybody who's gone before you, who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ, you can look forward to the, the grand reunion it will be when we all see each other again. There's one way. Jesus said, I am that way. I am the truth and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through me. You want to get to heaven? His name is Jesus, the Lamb of God. We celebrate now the Lord's table. We remember Jesus Christ. He commanded us that as often as you eat and drink from the cup, do this in remembrance of me. There are heresies in the world that say that that piece of unleavened bread and that that little cup of, blood, of uh, grape juice, that if I lifted it up and said just the right words, it would become the literal body of Jesus Christ and the literal blood that coursed through the, brain, the blood uh, coursed through the veins of Jesus Christ. That is heresy. Jesus didn't say, do this, uh, do this, uh, eat me, I will become re All he said was, as often as you eat and as often as you drink, do this in remembrance of me. This is the greatest memorial event. We celebrate Memorial Day in America. This is the greatest memorial event there could ever be when we look back on the cross 2,000 years and see just what it was that Jesus did for us. God the Father sent Him, but that Lamb of God came on His own accord. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life. No man takes my life. I give it freely. 
He wasn't compelled or forced by the Father to come to earth and die in your place. It was because He loved us that He came to take our place on the cross. It's an immensely wonderful thing that we do when we remember Jesus Christ and His sinless life, tempted in all ways yet without sin, when we remember Jesus Christ and His sinless life, and that we remember those last hours on the cross when He actually paid for our sins on the cross. That's what we do here. We remember the person and the work of Jesus. I'd like to ask the men that are going to help me pass out the elements to come.